Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. Hello and welcome to the Women's Day Podcast, a look back at some of the show's highlights this week. What this journey has taught me is indescribable and I cannot summarise in just one sentence. We are all human. We all want to be free and live our lives that are prosperous, carefree and full of joy. And we must never stop fighting for our rights to have the lives that we want. Cherish what you have. Be grateful for the family that you have, even in times when you're not loving them. It can be taken away so easily. And remember, everyone has a story. There is a reason why people are the way that they are. We must never judge anyone on looks, prejudice or from media inference. Look past all that. Be kind to everyone. There is no us or them. There is only us, one human family connected in many ways we sometimes forget. That is our studio guest, Erin Kelly, reading part of her blog, Ground Beneath My Feet. Um, Erin, we've been talking about the fact you describe yourself as a humanitarian. You've recently come back from Greece where you spent time with working with refugees and and really you've painted a picture for us of of people who actually in day-to-day life we could probably identify with Mm. and um we really need to be doing more i well i'm gonna say straight away i have family out of this whole experience i have i was saying to you wasn't i christy about my iraqi family in france now and sarah's two and she's learning french and you know for me it kind of goes past you know normal be nice to everybody and it's you know actually have family out of it so I forgot where the question was now <laughs> the, the point I, I think I was trying to make is that you know it's all very well for us watching images of refugees yeah. and thinking oh they are so completely different yeah to they're us. not at all they're just they're just like you and me and unfortunately you know you can't choose where you live um sometimes and you can't choose if you live in a conflict zone and I think sometimes you just need to sit down and speak to somebody and ask them you know, tell me your story, tell me what happened before you actually make that judgment. I think that's what I would say. Because people forget that these, you, you, we only see them as as refugees, whereas these people are lawyers, they are doctors, yeah. they are, you know, I was watching a film the other day and there was a, a very famous Syrian actor in it who lives in Aleppo and you think, what is, where where is he now? You know, yeah. and you've got to remember that these people are, like you say, just like us and professionals who have, yeah. you know, real history and family behind them as well. And also a lot of s- stories and things that you can actually learn from. You know, they're, wi- they're, they're just as wise as you and me. And sometimes, you know, sitting down with, I have um, a couple who are a Syrian family, um, Abu Ghazi and Garda, they're like my parents. They can sometimes give you so many words of wisdom when you're far away from home and, you know, Sometimes you just need that. They have seen the world just like you and me, and sometimes they have a different outlook, and it's nice to see a different perspective. Now, you have spent all this time in Greece then. Um, you talk about uh, the families that you yeah. uh, you feel that you are um, involved in from so many different parts of the world. What What's next for you then, Erin? It's a big... That's the question that I don't really like answering. Um, right now, I'm actually having a break um, due to um, personal health reasons. I... I've had to take a step back from humanitarian work, um, but I am in talks with Medicine Sans Frontieres, um, Doctors Without Borders. They have proposed me going to Chad, Congo or Central African Republic, um, and we're in talks about that right now. Um, I've applied for a UK med role, which is the emergency response to the UK government, um, and I'm just waiting for training to start for that. Um, but yeah, humanitarian work is where I want to go. I'll still do my locum work and I'll still go on all these escapades around the world that I like to go on. You know, I, I have a bit of a penchant for booking flights um, to far-flown places. So I will be doing a lot of that. But right now it's it's taking a step back and getting myself better first, focusing on number one and then... So where did this drive to, to do this humanitarian work come from? I mean, is it something that you grew up with? Is it in your family? No. Um, so my... My family's a very normal family and it was never ingrained to us to do anything like this. I don't know if it was circumstances, like I was you know, heavily bullied and maybe that's just made me a bit more caring and a bit more considerate to other people. I don't know. It's, I think something's ingrained into me somewhere that makes me want to do this. It's interesting because, you know, I was watching something um, uh, which I think you're aware of as well, the White Helmets documentary, which is about the the Syrian guys who have sort of given up everything in order to just be the first on the scene Mm -hmm. when there's been a a bomb dropped and they're sort of pulling people out of the rubble. And it does make you wonder, like when you just said, oh, I might go off to the Congo or I might go off here with Madison (laughs) Sophia, my instant reaction to that is, oh, my God, how would you do that? And you do wonder what it is, as you said, that sort of makes these people that brave 
that they feel compelled to to sacrifice themselves. I for think that. I think the way I see it is if I was in that situation myself, I would want somebody to you know sometimes give me a clean pair of knickers because I had to do that a few times or give me a hug or give me a banana or take my crying baby off me for five minutes so I got some respite because you know that's what you would want if you were in that situation so I think you know treat people how you would want to be treated. So does it really frustrate you then when there is all of that sort of kickback and a lot of it is in reaction to the media and the way the media are portraying this but does it frustrate you when people say well you know they're not our problem they're not really like us why why should we take them in how do you react to people saying things like that? I get quite upset because I was welcomed with open arms by so many people and I've got so many friends out of it and family and you know, they accept you. I, you know, I'm a British girl who you knew nothing about their culture or their lives beforehand and they accepted me and welcomed me in and it's, we should do the same. Does it make you want to grab people and just shake them until they take notice of what's going on out there? Um, take a step back first <laughs> before shaking them. But I, I think, yes, I think it's, it's, sometimes it's upsetting, but I think it is a lack of education. I think that's what it stems from. And like, like we were saying, it's the media. It's, it's really given a foul you know sort of cloud around what what it actually is it's just sad it must be weird for you coming home after doing something like that and being around sort of the creature comforts and the fact that a lot of us do just blinker all of these things out how do you cope coming back to what is what we would class as normal life I remember when I went shopping a few weeks ago I found that really difficult because I was spending I, I was in Victoria's Secret and I remember I was spending money on very expensive items in there and I thought you know it's it's I can go from one extreme to another and it's it was very difficult to come to terms with. Um, I, I write a lot and I'm doing a lot of writing about it. Um, I think that's been the best thing um, to kind of come to terms with stuff. I generally, I keep myself to myself and just go, you know, we are two separate worlds in a lot of ways. Humanitarian work and life on a beautiful little island don't really go hand in hand, do they? No. Some people, I guess, as I say, you know, we sit there and we watch the images and we feel desperately sorry for people um, that we see on the television, however they're portrayed. Mm-hmm. And you might wonder, you know, what? how much difference can one person make? You know, what is it that I can do? Three euros will buy a pair of shoes. I think that's how I would describe this. You think, how much does a banana cost? How much do nappies cost? How much does medication cost? But then who should we give this money to? Because there is a lot of press at the moment about how some of the organisations, even the Red Cross, is getting Mm. some really bad press at the moment. So who should we give our money to to make sure that happens correctly? Reputable charities, you know, make sure that they are going to do the research about where your money's going. Um, Like Kasala Aid are a a great organisation that we worked quite closely with um, and we know that their money's going back in to them. So it's just doing your research more than anything. And you've talked about the people that you've got to know. Is yeah. there somebody who sticks out in your mind, a, a sort of a personal story that really does stay with you? There's, there's so many. There's so many. I, I was saying to Christy about the kids. They're, they're my life now. And I've already said that if I could take them all home, I would do. Um, I think a lot of the pregnancies, I think that's been something that's resonated a lot with me. It's, you know, one of the most beautiful times in your life and when you're stuck in a tent, um, and you're lying on concrete in 40 degree heat you think oh, you know but I've I've been birthing partner to a few women recently and it's that's wow. been lovely so yeah you know something that's caused um controversy in the mm. past week is the fact that Lily Allen apologized on behalf of Britain for the refugee mm. crisis when she went to visit the jungle um some people suggested she had no place to do that it was okay for her she's a, a multi-millionaire um and actually, if she wanted to do something, she could easily do it herself. What did you make of, of that? I, I'm I, I kind of a bit double-sided when it comes to celebrities. They do do a lot for the community, though, because they do bring awareness. We've had so many, uh, like Angelina Jolie, when she came to our camp, that was amazing. Um, I was actually off work that day, so I was good. Oh, I no. never got to meet her, but she came to our camp. And this is a makeshift camp that we've made for 6,000 people, and that was incredible. So they do bring a lot of attention to this. With regards to what they have to say, they have a right to say it. And I don't think we should, I don't think we should sit there and tell them, you cannot say this, or you cannot say that. I think freedom of speech, and if she wanted to say, I'm sorry, then credit where credit's due you know she's got freedom of speech 
And you might remember on the programme yesterday, we talked about the footballer Ched Evans, who on Friday was cleared of raping a 19-year-old woman following a retrial. He'd always maintained that he'd had consensual sex at a hotel in Wales five years ago, but spent two and a half years in prison after being convicted at his original trial back in 2012. Now, his family employed investigative journalists to look into the case and found there was no DNA evidence, no forensics, and even the victim had never even claimed she was raped. She'd gone to police concerned her drink had been spiked and always admitted having no memory of what happened. Uh, Mr Evans' original conviction was overturned in just three hours after new evidence was uncovered about his alleged victim's previous sexual history, which is what we were discussing on the show yesterday. Now, that's not normally allowed, but the court accepted a request from Evans' legal team on this occasion. It's led to some concern from campaign groups who say people may now be put off reporting sexual crimes if they think the same thing will happen to them. Well, we asked you what you thought, and after the programme, lots of you have continued to get in touch to give us your views. And what's really, really interesting about this is many of them are completely opposed. For example, Gary says, I'm 100% sure if you were accused of a crime in which the accuser lied to give a different idea of character, you'd want to be able to have it to defend yourself, especially in a case where it's someone's word against yours. But then Christine says, that's like someone being accused of burglary and bringing up all the people previously invited into the house. Utterly irrelevant. So it led us on to to reading a really, really interesting article on the BBC website about whether footballers need lessons on sexual consent. Because in the first interview that Ched Evans did after being found innocent last week, he said he'd never been taught anything like that. And he believes in this day and age, it's something which people do need educating about. And actually, some football clubs are already taking preventative measures to make sure their players know the rules to stay out of trouble, basically, off the pitch. Uh, For example, Brighton and Hove Albion was the first team in the UK to offer consent training and counselling to all its young players, both male and female. Of course, it's not just football clubs that think it's important to educate young people on the issues around sexual consent. Uh, Oxford University Students Union has been running workshops for two years and this year they've become mandatory across the university's colleges. Orla White, who's the Vice President for Women at the University Students Union, said it was key that both men and women were educated. She says... We talk about the gender aspects of sexual violence and we think it's important to get rid of the misconceptions that it only happens to women. And many sex education experts agree that lessons like these should be taught at school and from a young age. Now this is a quote from someone who works with the Young People's Sexual Health and Wellbeing charity Brooke. Uh, They say... If my sex education had taught that consent is a sober, continuous, verbal and enthusiastic yes, rather than just the absence of a no, I might not have had to assure my friend that she didn't cheat on her boyfriend, another man raped her. So what we're asking you this afternoon is if you think we should be teaching consent in schools, uh, 166177, or you can email studio at manxradio.com. We're also on Facebook uh, and at MR Women's Day on Twitter as well. Um, as part of a sex education, Christy, do you think this should be part of it? Um, Well, obviously something needs to be done because there is still this massively grey area. But as we said yesterday, the grey area is generally because in a situation uh, where something does come to court, it's one person's word against another, really. And so that grey area is still potentially going to exist. But when it comes to consent, then yes, it does seem like there needs to be something done. Interestingly, we mentioned the university classes there in Oxford. Um, there was, there's actually been some debate about that because many of the students have been offended that they were seen as being ignorant of what consent means and a lot of them haven't actually attended the classes, which is very interesting in itself. Um, we have been in touch with the Department of Education about um, the, the rules governing sex education over here in the Isle of Man. Uh, we've been directed to the policy statement on sex and relationship education, which is on the government website. Um, essentially, it talks about each school having a written sex and relationship policy. Uh, sex and relationship education should not be delivered in isolation, but be integrated within the curriculum and the whole school ethos. However, it should form a discrete strand within the personal and social health education curriculum. It does go on. There's nothing specific um, about consent in there. Um, I'm interested, uh, Erin Kelly, in your views on this. Should we be teaching about consent in schools? I'm going to be completely honest. My sex ed at school, I can't remember any of it. I don't think it was very well taught. Um, And I'm in a profession that, you know, I have to obviously counsel patients on safe sex. And I've been in a position this year where I've had to teach a lot of refugees about safe sex. And there is a lack of education. I, I wouldn't have known about consent. 
I don't think it was ever something that was touched when I was younger, I don't think. You know, I'd like to think, uh, thinking about my own children, I've got two boys and a girl, and I'd like to think, especially, I, mean, I suppose I think especially of my daughter, that if she was ever in a, in a position in a sexual relationship, that she could say no at any time and that would be okay. Mm -hmm. And obviously teaching the boys, um, whichever path they take, um, the same things that no means no it doesn't matter at, at whatever stage that is i have um just watched a really really interesting um animation and it's called tea consent and basically it replaces um sex with tea and says you know somebody might enthusiastically say yes 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 i want a cup of tea so therefore you know they want a cup of tea they might say mm, no i'm not sure so you might make them a cup of tea anyway but you wouldn't force them to drink it and if someone was completely unconscious you wouldn't give them a cup of tea because unconscious people don't drink tea that's really good. We should post that on our page. I was really tempted to post it on the Women's Day Facebook page. There is um, a couple of uh, swear words in it. But I think in terms of a message that is absolutely clear, I have not seen anything better. Mm. Mm. Interestingly, actually, this morning, um, this and completely um, apropos nothing, it wasn't related to this at all, a friend of mine sent me an article that they thought might be interesting to discuss on the show. And it's actually about um, research uh, involving BDSM. And it's um, from uh, psychology researcher Catherine and Clement and she's published a study out of Northern Illinois University and this showed that BDSM practitioners are less likely to believe victim blaming myths or sexist stereotypes in the general population because she says they have a healthier understanding of sex and consent than other groups which is interesting because people sort of see BDSM as being oh it's a bit wrong and it's all a bit kinky it's not quite right but actually they have a very healthy understanding because it is all about okay at this point I'm not comfortable with this I have a safe word you know this is a no this is a yes and and actually, they do have a really good understanding of it, which is very interesting in itself. It's just about teaching you that your your own personal lines are OK. Wherever they are, they mm -hmm. are OK and they deserve to be respected. Um, Christine has emailed to say, yes, sexual consent should be taught at school. And so should explaining that sexual harassment is unacceptable and applies as much to females harassing males as it does vice versa. I'm particularly keen in embedding into everyone's psyche that everyone is entitled to their own personal space. Uh, lots of interesting thoughts. Hey. 17 minutes to three. We were talking about uh, Jean Alexander, who played Hilda Ogden, uh, who died days after her 90th birthday. Lindsay's email to say, Jean Alexander used to come into my lingerie shop in Southport in the 1980s for her thermal undies. She was very <laughs> unassuming and ordinary. Oh, that's lovely. Um, Lindsay, interestingly, we were talking about the, the civil partnerships for opposite sex couples um, and being the first in the Isle of Man. And Lindsay points out we were first in the Isle of Man for a number of other things, including the first to provide free education for all children up to the age of 12 in around the 1670s, the first to close our roads for road racing firstly in 1904 for the Gordon Bennett car racing trials then from 1907 for motorcycles and of course the first uh, in the world vote. to give women the vote mm -hmm. and uh, interestingly there is an event taking place on Thursday November the 3rd it's a hot pot supper evening uh, it's being organised by the friends of Sophia Gould and we had uh, Lynn Owens um, and Christine Cowley on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about the significance of this woman uh, for any woman really giving uh, rights to vote um, and this hot pot supper is taking place at Braddon Church Hall at 7 to 7.30. They've got two guest speakers, Hazel Hannon, the former MHK for Peel, um, and now a commissioner there, and Raina Chattel, who was the first woman to be given the Freedom of Douglas. Um, tickets are £8 each, and you can get them by calling 801780. 801780. Uh, now we are talking about the Manx Music Festival. We're joined by Dr Jacqueline Yates, who's the Festival Secretary, and Jane Corkle, who's a member of the Executive Committee. And interestingly, Jacqueline, we're talking uh, to Stephanie just before the break about the Legion players and you mm. said that uh, some of these drama groups were fundamental in keeping the music festival going during the war. Yes, yes that's right. Um, well the festival's been going 125 years and it continued throughout both of the world wars. I think in the second world war the music people said oh I think you know it's a bit too much going on we won't be having the festival this year and it was the drama people who said oh no we it's going to keep our spirits up you know, it's a good thing to do, even though times are difficult. So we've kept going right through both. Now, Jane, we were hearing um, that pretty much after the, the Guild, why is it called the Guild, incidentally? Why did the two names for it, do we know? Because it, it began uh, with the uh, Industrial and Arts Guild, I think it was mm. called, uh, in 1892, and there were choir classes as part of that. That was actually an exhibition, but Marie, Mary Louisa Wood uh, instituted the choir classes and that's where it started so okay. that's why it's called the guild that's why it's called the guild <laughs> well we we heard earlier that uh, once the music festival the guild has finished you have about a week off and then you start yeah. looking ahead uh, to the next year and i just wonder how you keep 
keep reinventing it almost while retaining its historical roots as well? Well, I think the committee, we try and listen to what the people who are involved in the festival want and, and what goes down well and what doesn't go down so well. Over the years, classes change, um, classes that were very busy 20 years ago dwindle in popularity. Um, so we, everybody gets together and look, looks at what's going on. They take on board suggestions that people make. Um, you know, and, and recently we introduced the uh, Battle of the Bands, the rock bands. Um, so trying to keep keep on top of what's popular. And the syllabus has been released today. Um, what is new for 2017? Well, this coming up year we have tap dance first time. We had the ballet modern and character last year, but we've added in tap this year. We've also got uh, the American art song, which has been requested. Jane is the best one to tell you about what that means. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> works by American composers, really. Uh, yeah. We have a class for um, French, Italian, lots of those kind of sort of uh, classical uh, singing and uh, British composers is very popular but there isn't a section for American composers and they've become more popular again as trends change so this year we've got or next year I should say we've got an American art song. Are we are we talking Great American Songbook here or are we talking Bruce Springsteen? <laughs> <laughs> well there is a popular song where you can yeah. go and sing Bruce That'll Springsteen. There. If, there, if, you go. there you go. We've got all. You can sing anything. Anything. In the there, there is uh, something David Bowie last year. <gasps> yeah, <laughs> quite right too. Oh, her eyes have just lit up. Yeah. <laughs> um, thinking about America, there is a very uh, strong link uh, with that and the Cleveland Medal, which is obviously the climax uh, of the whole festival. Um, where did the Cleveland Medal come from? Um, well, uh, in 1923, is it? Sorry, yeah, it's all before my time. Um, <laughs> Um, the Cleveland Manx Society wanted to do something to help the island really and to keep their connection with the island and they decided it would be nice to have something that the person would keep if they won this very prestigious competition so they had these gold medals uh, forged um, and sent over so every year they send one and uh, we've, we've got one for next year already so uh, come and compete <laughs> and Jane you teach um, piano and singing Presumably, you prepare people. Um, I do, for the if, guild. If, if they want to. It's not for everybody, but some people love it, some people don't. So, but how do you prepare them for dealing with the nerves that uh, Christy referred to earlier? Because even the seasoned performers must get pretty daunted on that stage. Well, one of the things I, I like to say to, to students is that when it comes to the actual judging of, of the competition, it's one person's opinion. You know, it's not necessarily right, it's not necessarily wrong. There's an audience of people there, they would all perhaps have a different preference as to who should win. Um, and just to try and get them to understand that the greater thing is to actually be on the stage and to perform. And the sense of achievement afterwards, when you've prepared something and worked really hard um, and gone through the highs and the lows of getting it right, um, to actually then get up there and achieve that, that's what it's all about. It's and that sense of achievement, I think. And who are the judges? Because you must have to have a, a large number of them, especially with all the new different classes. Yes, um, the adjudicators are all, well, not all, but mostly brought over from the UK or Ireland. Uh, we're part of the British and International Federation of Festivals, which has a list of um, adjudicators who've all been trained and approved. Um, and so we draw them from them. So they don't know people who are performing. So that's, that's a, a good big, thing. Very mm. important part of it. Obviously, for the Manx classes, Manx language, Manx dialect, Manx dancing, we have Manx adjudicators for that. That's unavoidable, really. Uh, but the others all come from off island. So we're talking about the syllabus, which has been uh, released today. How can people get hold of this and plan what they're going to do next year? The syllabus is available in about 30 shops and also in all the libraries on the island, or they can get it from me. Um, if you go to our website, manxmusicfestival.org, um, you, can, you can see there where you can get hold of it. Um, and um, just, just you can either enter online or you can enter with a paper application form, which is in the middle of the syllabus. And uh, when can people enter up until? until the 2nd, uh, no, the 4th of February, sorry. The 4th of February is the closing date. I know that sounds like a long way off, but it isn't really because the winter goes past so fast and people are already thinking about what they'd like to do. Um, the other thing that we're doing soon is there's a, a week with Simeon Wood, who's a flautist, who's coming to the island. He's going to be encouraging people to go in the wind classes. Um, so we've got workshops in schools, concerts, 
uh, and masterclass as well on the 12th of November, uh, which is quite exciting. And that's all explained in the syllabus and on our website if people would like to have a look there. And is there a performance that sticks out that's been uh, one of your favourites over the past few years? Well, I was very proud and my sister won the Cleveland medal, so that one sticks in my mind. Angela Stewart, um, she won it in, was it 1996? I, know, I, sang, sure I sang against her in that. <laughs> she won and I have no idea when it was, a long time ago. Yes, I came home for that because I was living away at the time and I always said if she ever got into the Cleveland medal, I'd come and watch. And so I came home for it and I was very proud when she won that. Oh. You're listening to Women Today on Manx Radio. 19 minutes to three now. Now, our studio guest this afternoon is Claire Hewitson from the shop Chalet in Ramsey. Uh, we've been talking already, Claire, about the fact that you have quite a bonkers range of products, if I'm, if I'm fair. It's <laughs> such a good mix of stuff you've got in the shop. Yeah. I'm intrigued to know who is your average customer. It ranges, actually. I mean, young girls come in the shop, you know, little girls uh, with their mums, and they love looking at different things in there. And, you know, up to the elderly and and men too. You know, there's a lot of um, men coming in at TT. They'd heard about the Tamanu healing balm um, and Ah. any bumps and scrapes that they'd had on their bikes and things. Uh, And word got round that the healing balm was really good. So I sort of, you know, if anybody had hurt themselves they come in and I sort of put that on and they went away quite happy so um, in fact our very own John uh, John Marsham this morning came in with a huge burn on his arm mm, and yeah. uh, he came running into our office when you'd obviously arrived <laughs> earlier and went I'm healed I'm healed I've got balm on my arm yeah. <laughs> he, seemed, he seemed quite happy it's actually the oil is from a nut they take the nut from the plant the tamanu plant um, it's about as big as um, a walnut I've got some here if you want to Ooh, smell it. It reminds me have, of um, of walnuts and it's got uh, healing properties in it. So She's passing um, it round, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. It's Ben's a sort of thick a of green a Get oil. Get your nose in. And it won that's an award lovely. best oh, for mums yeah. for stretch marks and scars. Oh, so that's good because absolutely brilliant. Somebody mentioned the likes of bio oil earlier because you need something like that, don't you? Yeah. So that, that does a mm. similar thing. That is amazing. And the smell of that. So it just melts onto your skin. Oh, it's a lovely consistency. Sometimes um, nature is best, isn't it? Because it's come yeah. going to natural products. And it, it, I should I should explain, really, we are talking about this uh, skincare regime and it's called Tropics. And the reason we're talking to you about it, one of the reasons is it has a really interesting backstory, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Um, it's all made by Susan Ma. She was brought up in Cairns in Australia. She first started, her first product was this Body Smooth. And I'll just pass this around as well. This is incredible. Oh, it's in a jar. Is, I like um, things in jars. This is um, a mineral salt right, scrub. Let's have a little smell. Um, it smells like a, a oh, lemon meringues to me. Like that does. It that's, really yeah, is it's lovely. Like, um, the, the edible ones are the most difficult ones because I genuinely <laughs> want to eat them. And she used to cook that up that. in the kitchen. Her and her mum actually moved to London. Oh, and what she used to do, all her time and energy went into making this first product, decanting it into jam jars um, and selling it at, at, um, at Greenwich Market. So that's how she put herself through uni. She bought her and her mum a house as well, her first car. So she dedicated wow, through selling all her this spare one product, time. Blimey. Yeah, and then she went on to the Apprentice in 2011. She didn't win the program; she was the runner-up. But Alan Sugar or Lord Sugar, Lord Sugar, yes, yes, he was so impressed with the ethos and her enthusiasm about the products um, that he backed her anyway. Wow, um, and I his think wife that's quite rare daughter. for him to do that, mm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's the only person he's ever ba- ever backed that hasn't wow. won the program. And he is actually in awe of her. You know, I've heard him talk. I went over You've to You've met the, him, haven't you? I have. I've met him a handful of times, yeah. I can't pretend to, to know him, you know, really well, but... Um, you wouldn't have him around for a cuppa? No. <laughs> but, what, but what's he like to sort of deal with? Was he nice? Is he, or is, he or is, is he that kind of, you know, how he appears on the TV? Um, he's a got scary. a really good sense of humour. He is a bit scary, but he's, he's a really nice guy. Uh, the first time I met him... Well, to meet him, you had to become a manager. So I went over. I joined Tropic. There there was 400 of us that joined at the beginning. Um, And now there's 5,000. So it's grown really quickly in just over three years. So I wanted to meet him personally. And to do that, you had to become a manager. So I came back to the island and I filled the criteria. You had to recruit, um, you know, a team, do so many sales. So within a few weeks... um, we had another meeting over there and in the south of the island um, of England and there was about 400 of us or more there 
that's where I got to meet him on stage. I nearly didn't because the coach was late. It's Elf like your job interview all coach. over again, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> so, so I took my shoes off and I walked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and because we were late coming in, apparently um, he didn't want to start without us being there. Um, oh. So we held up, you know, for about sort of 30, 40 minutes. We arrived really quick. We, we sort of burst through the doors. Uh, we were looking for somewhere to sit, so I ran right up to the back and sat at the back. And then, as he as we arrived, he called down names out the ones that had made manager. So then I run, dumped our stuff down, run back down the stairs, and that's when I met him. You know, and I said, "Sorry, we're late because you know the coach. I think we got lost on the way." There's a book that needs to be written here, your life story. In fact, I can see it now—a <laughs> six-part drama or something like that. But I do want to talk about the uh, the sort of skincare products, and mm. we sort of alluded to this already, Claire. You know, how necessary is it? to spend a lot of money on skincare products. You know, are the expensive ones worth it or actually is something reasonably cheap and straightforward actually just as good? I think what you need to look at is is not the price so much, is what goes into skincare. Um, with Tropic, um, there's no parabens. Um, it's certified that by the uh, Vegan Society. It's cruelty-free, it's gluten-free, it's made with premium natural ingredients. Um, and that's the most important thing. Your skin is the biggest organ and you need to look after your skin. Does Just Dave try. use these as well? He did, actually. Susan Ma um, just brought out a men's range, um, which we were asking her for. And if there's any anything that we, we really want her to add into the um, catalogue, then then she does try to do that for us. So and does she still amazing. create it all herself then? Yeah, she she travels in, in all a pan over in the a world. kitchen like she did with the other stuff. She's got a beauty <laughs> kitchen in Surrey, which has tripled in size um, since she started. Wow. So yeah. So you um, must have met her as well, presumably. I have. I've met her. Is she very times. inspiring? Because looking at her website and her blog, she seems like an incredible woman. She is amazing. I mean, she's she's like a little pocket rocket, really. She's tiny, but she's so enthusiastic. She's such a lovely person. She remembers me when I go over. So the Man Made Collection. There's a shave cream. Um, there look sharp. Do you think um, men are a, a, a little bit embarrassed still about skincare? Ben, you can answer this one. Because most men wouldn't admit to doing this, I think. I do wonder, though, if things are changing, because I think certainly at one time you would never have admitted. In fact, I don't think many men would have used any skincare products at all. But the whole sort of metrosexual thing, people like David Beckham have mm -hmm. very much led mm. the way in that. So, I mean, I moisturise in the morning. I have to because actually my skin gets quite dry after I've uh, come out of the shower. So it's more of a, a comfort thing. But I, I think men are definitely embracing this more do you, do you find that is the case claire is it is it a much more i don't know socially acceptable thing for men to talk about down the pub these days it is yeah and we really did need a men's uh, a men's range um that i get some customers um one customer buys the um tomorrow healing balm because he has uh, rosacea he had t terrible rosacea and he said it blisters i have no idea what that is sorry <laughs> it's a skin condition on your face and it it sort of he said it blistered it was so, it hurt mm. so bad oh bless him uh, but he used the tamano healing balm morning and night and i saw him at the royal show at the royal max show a few weeks ago now um, and his skin was amazing. I'm just so imagining all takes... these people walking around glowing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is it. I, I had a little bit of rosacea on my cheek a few years ago. Thankfully, ah. it was it was fairly minor and it went away by itself. But I was right. looking; it, it did hang around for longer than I wanted it to, and it was yeah. it was just a, getting a bit worse. And then thankfully, went away. But something like that, you would yeah. obviously recommend. It seems to do the trick, like you say, with burns, colds, anything like that. It's... It is. It's brilliant. And the. Um... We asked Susan Mark because I had a, a meeting with her with other managers um, the following day after our um, get together last month. Um, and I said, what does the man-made collection smell like? And she said, it smells like a really good looking guy. Oh, I love so it. So I think that's a really <laughs> good description. Go. Well, hopefully we're, in, we're empowering men now. This to, is what it's all about. To look this after afternoon. their yeah. skin. We're empowering men. <laughs> well, thanks so much for talking to me. Now, our studio guest this afternoon is a mother who three years ago lost her daughter to sepsis. And since then, she has been working tirelessly to raise awareness about the condition, educating people about the signs and symptoms that really could save lives. Dee Struthers, thank you so, so much for being with us this afternoon. And before we talk a little bit about sepsis, just tell us first about Anne. What was she like? Well, she was a very family orientated girl. She was um, 18 years of age and um, her life's passion really was family and visiting family and being with her friends. Um, 
kept well. She never really sort of had anything wrong with her. So she was quite a, a sort of buoyant person and had a, a zest for life, really, yeah. So at what point um, did you realise that there was something wrong with her? Well, it was about a week before she ended up in hospital. Um, so we had a, a wedding in Scotland and she complained of a sore throat. And um, we just thought it was a you know, a sore throat, really, and maybe the flu sort of coming on later on. But um, by the time we get back and through the week, as the week progressed, um, she developed a cough, um, which my friend d- described as a like an asthma-type cough. It wasn't a productive cough. It was just really a, a cough. She became lethargic and tired, and by the Friday, um, she had developed a pain in her side. Yeah. And presumably you, you had sought medical attention. Was sepsis ever raised as a possibility? Not at that point, because it was just like a normal teenage um, flu type thing that we felt that it was, because we were never at the doctor for very much. Um, so by the Friday night, when she said her pain was really excruciatingly sore um, I said to her well we'll have to take you up to A&E her dad at that point was um, playing the bagpipes at Tin Motel and um, I said I'll go and get your dad and I'll come back to the car and get you and we'll go to A&E by the time John and I got back to the car um, she was on, laid back in the chair, she seemed a bit better on the phone just texting away and, and she said I don't want to go to a and she says I'm, I'm okay I want to go back home so it wasn't until the next day that I actually went into her bedroom and um, I asked her if she was okay and she said no she wasn't feeling right and I could see that she wasn't well so I took her pulse and it was 130 and her breathing was very fast and shallow and I took her temperature as well but there was no temperature she didn't have a temperature um, but I, I thought well this pulse rate is far too fast I'm going to take you back I'm going to take you up to A&E so we took her up to A&E and um, I explained to the doctor and the, the nurse that a pulse was very fast and breathing fast and shallow she'd started with a sore throat and developed a cough very lethargic um, and the, the outcome of that was the doctor just said it was um intercostal muscle pain due to coughing which I knew it wasn't because she wasn't really coughing that hard to create the, the pain. Um, anyway we were given anti-inflammatories and p- stronger painkillers um, and sent off home with them and um, it was not until through the night that the picture really very quickly changed. And at that point was she admitted to hospital after that? Well, I think when we got her, she shouted on me. She actually shouted on me from the room and I went through and she said, which was quite strange, her papa had told her to shout on me and that I would know what to do. Um, well, her papa died 10 years before, so it was. Uh, I knew that she was starting to become a bit confused and a bit disorientated, which is part of the signs and symptoms of um, the sepsis 6. Um, so I shouted at her dad and he came through and we... I originally thought it might be um, the painkillers were too strong for her because she wasn't normally in strong painkillers. So again, the delay and I went and got my iPad and looked up, well, it was actually my laptop, and I looked up the signs and symptoms and I, I thought I was beginning to suspect it was pneumonia. Um, so I said to my husband, this is right, in the car. So we got our other daughter up out of the car and we all went up to A&E and very quickly at the hospital they said, you've got a very sick daughter here. And I thought, well what had happened from the day before and you just look at yourself and think if I had really taken it up on the Friday would it have been different if I'd taken it up and if they'd realised on the Saturday done more tests, x-rays, blood tests whatever, could it have been a different story that we're telling today Um, I'll never know and that's why I've really taken this on board now to make the public more aware, to be able to ask the question could it be sepsis um, if you've got any of the signs and symptoms and I'll go through them with you if you want me to. We will talk more about uh, sepsis and and go through that in detail a little bit later but I just wonder before Anne died how much did you know about sepsis? I'd never heard of sepsis and my husband's a health professional and he'd never heard of sepsis either. I'd heard of septicemia 
which is um, a blood poisoning that's a dated form now that the sepsis is the update of that um, sepsis is your body's reaction to an infection so you might have a compromised immune system or you might have be just low on yourself and have a few bugs one after the other and your systems went quite low so it depends on how your body's going to react to that infection and it can be very quick because it's misdiagnosed with um, flu-like symptoms and normally we're told if you've got a flu symptom stay away from hospital um, you'll pass your germs you know around everybody so don't go near them but in actual fact you have to get up there really quickly and get the antibiotics and the, the oxygen and the fluids into your system to stop this happening and, and it is treatable it can, it can be caught and, and you know you can beat it um, for want of a better word but uh, yeah it's uh, very important to to recognise now and as I say it can be misdiagnosed for other things as well if you've got a urine infection or you can get it in any manner of ways from a sore throat as Anne's had started but also from a visit to your dentist as we know from the, the man on the, the television from Tom Ray whose story was you know, on in the film, whatever. Um, yeah, it can happen through post-op symptoms uh, if you get an infection in a wound um, and a chest infection. So, yeah. And I guess the thing is that these are all fairly typical and fairly common things and, and you wouldn't naturally think of the worst case scenario. So, so people are very often misdiagnosed and it's not just in Anne's case, this has happened many, many times before. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think UK Sepsis Trust um, has up to now been sort of quoting the figures um, that 150 people develop sepsis, but there's 44,000 people actually lose their life in Britain, um, the UK, to sepsis. But since the World Sepsis Day back in September, I think they're starting to think that it's nearer 60,000 people losing their lives in the UK to sepsis. Now, when they were saying it's 44 in the Isle of Man, that equates to about 200 people a year losing their lives to sepsis. So why don't we know more about it then? I think because the doctors are finding it so hard to diagnose because the symptoms are so um, misdiagnosed under other conditions like, you know, a chest infection, pneumonia, whatever, um, they're finding it hard and we're sent away and time's lost. In actual fact, the time factor is really important because every hour counts when they need to get the antibiotics into you um, to, to help counteract the, the, the sepsis going through your system. Because um, the, the longer it's left, the, the more you can become disabled by it. Um, you may lose limbs through it. Eventually, you will, you know, if you've, you're not getting treated and it's not beaten by the, you know, the drugs or whatever, um, you can lose your life to it as we, sort of, you know, know through having lost on. Yeah. And is is anyone more susceptible than anyone else to it, or is it just sort of it can happen to anyone? No, that's the, that's the problem. I think it's um, it can happen to babies. Um, it can happen to teenagers who are particularly toxic um, because they're starting relationships and, you know, bugs are getting transferred between them and um, it depends on how their system reacts to that. The, it, our age group, um, through post-op or whatever, um, chest infections, the elderly through urine infections. So it crosses the whole um, range of age groups and conditions as well. Yeah. So the important thing to remember that it is, is treatable if it's detected early enough. So talk us through the signs and symptoms then. Um, well, the UK Sepsis Trust call this the Sepsis 6. And this is what um, they say that if you've got one of these symptoms, um, to flag it up, go to your doctor, ask the question, could it be sepsis? So the first one is slurred speech, um, which obviously can be misdiagnosed again from, you know, a stroke or whatever. Um, extreme shivering or muscle pain. And I've heard people saying that it is really extreme to the point that their body, the whole body's been racked and you can't even move sometimes because it's like the toxic shock. Um, passing no urine in a day it says here but in actual fact I think a day is probably too long probably even like half a day 12 hours if you haven't passed urine you start thinking hmm there's something not right here severe breathlessness um, again can be misdiagnosed for chest and you know conditions um, some people have actually said that they feel that they might die um, which is a bit of a strange one but that's what you know they're saying and skin you can have mottled skin and Everybody's heard about um, 
meningitis and we know where to do the glass test and everything. Um, but in actual fact, I think about 78 people a year die from meningitis and sometimes it's the actual sepsis that gets the, their bodies, you know, affects them rather than the actual meningitis. So it's like a big thing really. Yeah. And Dee, the thing you're saying is that if you've got any of these symptoms, really what you need to be doing is asking a medical professional, could this be sepsis? Maybe flagging it up at that point and looking for a possible diagnosis. Definitely. And I don't think we should be frightened to ask that question. I really think it's important and the, the medical profession need to listen. I mean, if if I had had that question to be to ask when Anne wasn't well, um, I would have asked it. And you mentioned uh, the fact that you are going for um, charity status for a local branch of, um, what's it going to be, will it be called Manx Sepsis? Manx Sepsis, yeah, and it'll be spelt, everybody keeps thinking it's a misspelling, but it's Anne's name in the middle of Manx um, Sepsis, yeah, in her memory. And if anybody wants to support you in what you are doing, Dee, I've described it before as as incredible. You've been out speaking to so many people, you're giving out leaflets, you're coming here talking to us. It must be incredibly emotionally draining at times, but... What an amazing thing you are doing in your daughter's memory. I feel uh, since I started the, this, this sort of journey on trying to raise awareness, I've, I felt more empowered and, and you know sharing the message. And if it just saves one life, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. But it is building up momentum and it's making everybody uh, waking up to the fact that this could affect anybody at any time and how quickly it can change your life. So it is, it's important. It's a very important message. Thank you so much for downloading the Women Today podcast. As ever, if there's a guest you'd like to hear on the show or something you think we should be talking about, then we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us via email. It's womentoday at manxradio.com or you can go to the Women Today Facebook page, like and follow the page while you're there or we're also on Twitter. It's at MR Women Today. Until next time, goodbye. Don't sit in the slow lane. Join the fast lane right now with Shaw's all-new Superfast Plus Broadband. Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.